Hello, I'm Rachel Carey. I'm a lecturer in food systems in the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences at the University of Melbourne. And I investigate what happens behind the scenes in bringing our food to us from farm to fork or from paddock to plate. I'm particularly interested in how cities are fed, rapidly growing cities like Melbourne, and how we can ensure that everybody has access to enough healthy and sustainably produced food, and how we can maintain access to enough food through the shocks and stresses that we've been facing recently and that we're likely to face in future. We tend to think of Melbourne and Australia as being places that are food secure. So we often hear about how Australia produces enough food to feed around 60 million people, many more than we need to feed. And we often see that the supermarket shelves are generally full of food all year round. But in the last year during COVID-19 and during the 2020 bushfires, that hasn't always been the case. And sometimes we've seen images like this one. Images of empty supermarket shelves during early in the lockdowns when there was sudden consumer demand for food and it took supermarkets a while to catch up with that demand. So we didn't always find what it was that we were looking for on the supermarket shelves. Or images like this one of a $150,000 celery crop being dug back into the ground by farmers in Victoria's Lidenau Valley because of a shortage of seasonal workers to pick that crop. Or images like this one of international students who are queuing outside the town hall in Melbourne because they've lost their source of employment, because they don't have access to an income, they're not able to go home, and because they don't have access to government assistance to help them to buy enough food. And they're queuing here for food vouchers. So COVID-19 has placed stress on the food system in many different ways. And it's revealed some of the cracks, some of the places that the food system is currently vulnerable. So this talk is about what we need to do to strengthen the resilience of Melbourne's food system to shocks and stresses into the future, particularly shocks and stresses related to climate change and related to pandemic. It's certainly true that we produce a lot of food. We're, we're a big food exporter. Um, and so there's certain types of foods that we produce a lot of. And of course, there are things like grains, wheats, um, you know, livestock products. So we export a lot of animal products, meat and milk and things as well. But that really, this narrative that we have about Australia being a food secure country, it masks some of those areas where the food system is more vulnerable underneath. And I think it's really important that we start to have a conversation about, um, about the food system and the way that we produce food, perhaps in a more nuanced way. So for instance, our supplies of um, vegetables particularly are not necessarily that great. So in fact, if people were to actually eat uh, as many vegetables as we're recommended to eat, then we wouldn't have enough vegetables to meet that supply in the country. I mean, of course, most, only around 4% of people currently actually consume the recommended you know, number of vegetable serves. Um, but if we were to try to move people towards healthier diets, towards better food consumption, we wouldn't have enough vegetables to meet those needs. So I think we need to have a more nuanced conversation um, about the food system and also about how it is that we match up our food supply with the type of healthy, sustainable diet that we might want people to be consuming in future as well. So by resilience, we mean broadly that the food system is able to withstand shocks and stresses and, and can continue delivering a sufficient supply of nutritious, sustainably produced and culturally appropriate food. But resilience is about more than simply withstanding shocks and stresses. It's also about the capacity of the food system to adapt to the changing circumstances and to transform, to build longer term resilience to future shocks and stresses. And community resilience is going to be central to that, our collective and our individual capacity to adapt. So this talk is about the lessons that we can learn from what we've been through recently with COVID-19 and the 2020 bushfires in relation to the impacts on the food system. It's also about how we can harness a moment like COVID-19, which has changed so many things in our lives, to also transform the food system so that it's healthier, so that it's more sustainable and more resilient to future shocks and stresses. And this talk draws on the findings of research project that I lead at the University of Melbourne called the Food Print Melbourne Project. And it's funded by the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. We've been collaborating with a wide range of partners on this project, including the City of Melbourne and other metropolitan local governments and peak bodies. We've been collaborating with them to assess the resilience of Melbourne's food system to shocks and stresses, particularly related to climate change and related to pandemic. And as part of this research, what we've been doing is we've been interviewing stakeholders about how COVID-19 and the 2020 bushfires have affected the food system. 
we've mapped how food flows through the city of Melbourne and where our supply chains might be vulnerable. And we've carried out workshops with stakeholders where we've aimed to co-design policy approaches to make the food system more resilient to future shocks and stresses and to build the capacity of stakeholders to respond to these shocks and stresses. And this is the region that we've been looking at. So it's an area around 100 kilometres outside of Melbourne's CBD. It includes food growing areas that many people might be familiar with, like the Mornington Peninsula Shire and the Yarra Valley, as well as places like Bacchus Marsh, Werribee and Cardinia Shire as well. And as we'll see, this region grows a lot of food, which is an asset to the resilience of Melbourne's food system. But food growing areas in this region are at risk of urban development, of urban encroachment into farmland on Melbourne's fringe as a result of Melbourne's rapidly growing population. So I want to start by looking at what some of the impacts have been from these recent climate shocks and from pandemic shock on the food system. And it's really important that we understand these types of events and how they affect the food system because we're likely to face more of them in the future, particularly in the context of climate change. So climate change is leading to more frequent and more severe extreme weather events like bushfires, floods and droughts. And here in Victoria, we live in a part of the world that's warming and drying. It's particularly vulnerable to drought and to bushfire events. And these types of shocks and stresses have impacts throughout the food system from food production right through to food retail and consumption and recycling as well. And the first thing to say, of course, is that really our food system has coped relatively well during these recent shocks and stresses. For the most part, most people have had access to enough good supplies of food. But the impacts of these shocks highlight some of the places that the food system is vulnerable. Some of the cracks have appeared. And these are areas where the food system needs to be strengthened. And these impacts include things like a decrease in the amount of some foods produced due to crop losses and livestock losses, labour shortages that can affect some types of foods being harvested, a reduction in capacity of some types of food manufacturing and processing, and disruption to supermarket distribution centres and to food freight. And there can be lower availability of some types of foods in supermarkets and other stresses. And food prices can rise, particularly prices for things like fruit and vegetables. So at the height of the millennium drought in Australia from 2005 to 2007, food prices rose 12%, but vegetable prices rose 33% and fruit prices rose 43%. And our fruit and vegetable supplies are particularly affected because they're mainly domestic supplies produced in Australia. And of course, when food prices rise, that particularly affects vulnerable people on low incomes. And we see a rise of food insecurity as a result. There's also potential for increased food waste and food loss throughout the food supply chain. And I want to just illustrate some of these impacts that we're talking about by looking at what's happened during COVID-19 and during the recent 2020 bushfires. So the major bushfire event in early 2020 in New South Wales, Queensland and the east of Victoria had impacts throughout the food system. And they include significant livestock and crop losses. So an estimated 70,000 head of livestock were lost nationally. And also smoke haze affected the productivity and yield of some types of crops. Road closures and major supply routes led to higher transport costs and forced freight and trucks to find new routes. And there were issues with supply in some regional towns. Supermarkets in affected areas were closed. And the price of some produce like broccoli and cauliflower and lettuce increased, particularly where production had been affected. Power was lost, and that led to the loss of some types of foods, of stocks in stores, telecommunications were affected, and that affected payment systems and the ability to withdraw cash. So some people found themselves without the means to actually pay for food that they wanted to buy. And many people in fire-affected areas experienced difficulties in accessing food, particularly vulnerable population groups, and there were widespread food relief efforts in the aftermath of the bushfires. There was also increased food loss and waste due to power outages, and that led to the loss of food stocks in both homes and in stores as well. And also there have been delays in harvesting of fruit and vegetables that led to more food loss and waste. And more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic has had other impacts throughout the food system. There are labour shortages on farms in Victoria because of a lack of seasonal workers due to the closure of international borders. Supermarket distribution centres, abattoirs and some types of food processing and manufacturing have had their capacity reduced to around 60 to 70 percent of normal processing capacity in Victoria during the COVID-19 lockdown due to social distancing restrictions and new hygiene procedures that needed to be brought in. 
International and state border closures have also disrupted road and air and sea freight, and that led to delays in some types of supplies coming in, and particularly related to imported foods and imported ingredients. And air freight has been affected by the grounding of passenger planes because, in fact, passenger planes carry much of our food freight that's air freighted into the country. We also saw, of course, demand surges in supermarkets. Supermarkets were caught out by the sudden increase in consumer demand for some types of foods as states went into lockdown, and that emptied shelves of some types of foods. And we saw images like this in, in supermarkets and temporary food shortages. Supermarkets, of course, have just-in-time supply chains, and that means that much of the food is actually further back in their supply chain. They have months to plan for these um, surges in demand in relation to times like Easter or Christmas, but of course they weren't able to do that prior to the lockdowns and they were caught out. And that's what led to these sorts of scenes that we saw of empty supermarket shelves. And there's also been an increase in food loss and waste on farm. The shutdown of the hospitality sector and the food service sector during COVID-19 lockdowns led to increased food waste for some farmers who were selling into those sectors and who were unable to find other markets to sell into. Some farmers had to plough crops back into the soil because they were unable to find new markets. And many have had to do that recently because of a lack of seasonal workers to harvest fruit and vegetables. But one of the most significant impacts, of course, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, has been rising food insecurity. As one of our interviewees said, it's as if what was once a relatively hidden problem in Australia has come into the spotlight. The job losses and the economic crisis that's accompanied COVID-19 has pushed more people into food insecurity. So that they're unable to afford to buy enough um, healthy food and they've had to miss meals or they've worried about running out of money to buy food. And the food relief agencies have reported a significant increase in people who are requesting food relief during COVID-19. COVID-19 has really highlighted the fragility of our existing systems of food relief for addressing widespread food insecurity during events like COVID-19. Food relief is almost entirely dependent on the not-for-profit and charitable sector in Australia. So what happened was, as consumer demand for food rose from food relief, the supermarket shelves were emptying, and that meant that there was less surplus food available for the supermarkets to transfer to the food relief agencies. The food relief sector is also entirely reliant on volunteers and almost overnight the sector lost its workforce due to the COVID-19 lockdown. So the experience of COVID-19 has really raised fundamental questions about this system of food relief and also about the role of government in ensuring that all Australians have access to a healthy and sustainable and appropriate diet at all times. I think it was beginning to be, beginning to be a shift. I think that COVID-19 for instance, it's had an impact in terms of a higher level of awareness about the fact that our systems of, you know, our food supply systems are more vulnerable than we might first have thought. For the first time, some of us have seen empty supermarket shelves or have, you know, been aware that we're not always able to get the food that we want when we want it. And I think that's been a bit of a wake-up call. And so I, I think and I would hope that government is looking at that and is certainly you know, recognising the need, therefore, to be protecting land on the fringe of Melbourne, to protect this incredible asset that we have of Melbourne's food bowl. And part of the reason we're so lucky with that is just our climate. You know, we're able to grow a huge amount of food here all year round. We have incredibly long growing seasons. And so far, although we've lost a lot of farmland, we haven't lost as much as some other cities like Sydney so far, um, which has lost more. Um, and we still have the capacity to be producing a, a quite significant amount of food locally if we protect that land now. If we say enough, you know, good soils are not a place that we put houses, we put those houses elsewhere and that we just put in place permanent protection for that land and we start investing in the infrastructure to use more recycled water to produce food on the fringe of the city. Because it may be that we need to move more food production back to the fringe of the city, in fact. If in the future, in a warming and drying climate, there simply isn't as much water as there has been in the Murray-Darling Basin system, for example, it's possible that we need to move more water-intensive food production back to the fringe of cities because of the availability of more secure sources of recycled water. But we can only do that if we've taken the steps now to protect the land that's close to those water treatment plants. So it's really about you know, looking to the future, thinking about the stresses that we're likely to face and saying, 
what can we do now? What actions should we take now to ensure that we have a secure food supply for what is still a rapidly growing city? So what do these experiences of bushfires and COVID-19 tell us about the features of a food system that's likely to be resilient into the future? Well, one of the things that interviewees in our research have really emphasised is that there's a lot of uncertainty about what comes next, which shocks and stresses might eventuate, in what sort of combination. There are limits to our ability now to plan for all eventualities. And so it's important that we start to take actions that are going to build the resilience of the food system, no matter what type of shock or stress comes along next. We're also facing more frequent, more severe shocks and stresses, and those shocks and stresses are coming closer together with little time to recover in between. So COVID-19 hit shortly after the 2020 bushfires. And in New South Wales, some towns that experienced the bushfires and COVID-19 have now been hit by quite severe flooding. So we need to be able to plan for these types of compound shocks and stresses and focus on the actions that we can take to build the fundamentals of a more resilient food system for the longer term. As one of our interviewees said, what's the thing that's going to strengthen us to better prepare for any of those things happening? So our research suggests that a more resilient food system is likely to have a number of key features. And I just want to talk about a few of those features now. One is that the system is likely to be diverse. Resilient food systems that can continue supplying fresh, healthy food through shocks and stresses are likely to be diverse. They're likely to be diverse in the geographic locations that we source food from. So global, national, regional, and local sources of food. And so that if routes into the city are affected by a major event around Melbourne, that we still have access to local sources of food that we can draw on. Also diverse in the types of crops that we grow, the types of livestock that we raise. So that if one type of crop or one type of livestock is affected by a disease, that we have others that we can rely on. Also diverse in the types and scales of food production, small scale as well as large scale production, community-based production as well as commercial production. And diverse in the types of enterprises that we source our food from, so that we're not dependent on just a few enterprises in particular supply chains, large-scale enterprises, but also small-scale enterprises as well. Large-scale enterprises often have more resources behind them and they're able to get up and running more quickly after a major event. But smaller-scale enterprises can be more nimble, more adaptable during these types of events. Resilient food supply chains are also adaptive and they're innovative. And we saw this during COVID-19. The major supermarkets had to respond quickly to the surge in food demand during the pandemic in late March and early April to get food back on supermarket shelves as quickly as possible. At times, trucks were bypassing distribution centres and going straight to supermarkets. The supermarkets also set up pop-up distribution centres and they operated different hours outside of the normal curfew times to make sure that enough product got back onto supermarket shelves. At the small scale and the local level, we saw farmers innovating by opening up online stores and online farmers markets. And civil society organisations also came together to form collaborative networks, including a network called Moving Feast, which is a group of NGOs that have created a new system of food relief for Victorians that's based on produce from local farmers and from a network of community gardens throughout the city. The pandemic's also highlighted the risk of centralised supermarket distribution centres and processing facilities, where we have just one or two types of these facilities for a major city or for particular supply chains. Some of these centres, of course, have had to close due to COVID-19 cases. Some of our supply chains have become very centralised in recent years, where just one or two big players dominate a whole sector or a whole supply chain. And some of our interviewees suggested that we need to now decentralise our supply chains and have many more distribution centres and many more processing centres to reduce the risk. Our interviewees have also emphasised how important networks and collaboration are at all levels to more resilient food systems. Existing networks of stakeholders that are built on relationships of trust enable quick responses and enable rapid adaptation when disasters happen. Some local governments in Victoria still had their networks established from the 2020 bushfires when COVID-19 hit, and they were able to draw on those networks in order to enable a rapid response to COVID-19 during the pandemic. And neighbourhood and community networks are also important. They help enable local collaboration to strengthen resilience. We've seen this with some of the neighbourhood mutual aid networks that were established during COVID-19 that have helped to increase food security 
within local communities. I think we need to be a little bit careful about some of the benefits that we're claiming for locally produced food. And I think that sometimes, um, you know, we can claim benefits that aren't necessarily there. If we look at, you know, what the major impacts are from the food system and how we can make choices that are, are going to help um, in terms of being more sustainable, then probably where our food comes from, in fact, isn't going to be at the top of the list. We're likely to get bigger benefits in terms of uh, eat, eating in a more sustainable way from the choices that we make about what we eat and about how that food was actually produced rather than where that food came from. Now, that doesn't mean to say, for instance, that local, locally produced food doesn't have many benefits. It, it does. There's a lot of benefits there, particularly economic benefits, right, for local local farmers particularly, um, ensuring that our food dollar is circulating in our local food economies, building the resilience of the food system, ensuring that local farmers continue farming on the fringe of the city. But I guess that argument about food miles being really important, perhaps we've realised isn't as important as people might have thought it was, at least from a greenhouse gas emissions point of view, for instance. We're likely to get much bigger savings in terms of greenhouse gas emissions by um, eating a bit less meat than we do, for instance, or in some cases a lot less meat than we do currently. Um, you know, shifting to more plant-based diets and thinking about how that food was produced. So what types of no regrets actions and policies might we want to build the resilience of the food system for the longer term? What are the underlying fundamentals of a more resilient food system? There are many areas where we need to take action, but our research suggests that there are five particularly promising opportunities to build the resilience of our food system for the longer term. And these are areas where there are gaps or vulnerabilities in the system currently. One is that we need to rebuild regional and local food supply chains. Our current food system works very effectively to bring food across long distances through global and national food supply chains. And the ability to source food globally and nationally is a very important part of a more resilient food system. But our food system isn't currently very effective at bringing local food to people who are living locally. So if you live in the Mornington Peninsula and you go to buy strawberries, you're quite likely to buy strawberries that have come from the Mornington Peninsula all the way into Melbourne and then all the way back out down to the Mornington Peninsula again. And it's very difficult for people to identify what's actually grown locally or to choose to support local farmers. So the ability to source local food through local and short food supply chains is an important part of a more resilient food system, particularly in a country like Australia, where there are such vast distances between major state capitals. So there's an opportunity here to strengthen regional and local food supply chains that connect producers around Melbourne directly to consumers and to businesses in the city, so that we're also supporting local farmers, enabling them to remain farming on the fringe of Melbourne, and so that we can build our local fresh food supplies against future shocks and stresses. We're incredibly lucky in Melbourne that we are situated within a highly productive food bowl. Although we tend to think of food growing areas as rural or regional areas that are a long way from our cities, in fact, a lot of food grows on the fringe of Melbourne. In 2015, Melbourne's food bowl produced enough food to meet around 41% of the metropolitan Melbourne region's demand for food. And it's particularly important to fruit and vegetable production, and this region um, grows around half of the vegetables that grow in the state of Victoria. But farmland on the fringe of the city is also at risk from urban development as Melbourne grows. Melbourne's food bowl is an important asset, a really important asset in a world of more frequent and more severe shocks and stresses. And if we want to strengthen the resilience of the city's food system, it's really important that we now protect the farmland and the natural water resources that are on the city fringe as well. And the current Victorian government policy process to strengthen protection for Melbourne's green wedges and agricultural land is a really important part of this process. So we are really quite a water stressed country, at least in certain parts of the country, in the southeast of the country and, and in our state as well. You know, we're a warming and drying part of the world. And certainly in the past, we have still extracted large amounts of water from the river systems for livestock products that are then exported, you know, even during drought. Of course, during drought, what happens is we're producing less of those products, but we're still producing them. And we've certainly been through times in the past um, when, you know, during, during the major millennium drought, 
when uh, you've had local vegetable producers who had stopped coming to local markets simply because they weren't able to produce enough vegetables, you know, for the local population. So I think that there's definitely conversations that we want to have there about what are the priorities when we have finite amounts of natural resources, well, we're particularly short of resources like water. At the moment, what we say is that those resources should go to the highest bidder. So a resource like water moves to the those people who are prepared to pay the most for the water, whether that be a farm or, in fact, whether that be the local golf course, if that, if that local golf course is prepared to pay more for the water. So maybe we want to start to think about, well, how is it that we use these natural resources that are in limited supply to ensure that we have a healthy and sustainable food supply for the local population, as well as thinking about the exports that obviously are really important to the economy as well. It's really about just having a different, I think, a different type of conversation um, where we look at some of that in a more nuanced way. Another opportunity to strengthen the resilience of Melbourne's food system is to build circular food economies that close the loop and use natural resources efficiently by reusing city waste on local farms. Cities have advantages as places to grow food because they have access to important city waste streams, particularly recycled water and also food waste. Currently, only a very small amount of these waste sources is used to produce food. So Melbourne has two main water treatment plants, the eastern and western treatment plants. They produce a lot of recycled water, but currently only around 10% of that water is used to produce food. Most of the water produced by the plants is, is not used for any productive purpose and is, is in fact discharged at sea. So we need to invest in the infrastructure to store more of this recycled water and to make more of that recycled water available to farmers. City waste is also an important source of nutrients for growing food, important nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. If we can capture more of that city waste, we can feed that waste to animals that can be composted and reused on city farms. So in future, we can close the loop, treat city waste products as resources and recycle valuable nutrients and wastewater in the food system. Another way to increase the resilience of the food system is to promote resilient and sustainable production systems that don't rely heavily on external inputs like synthetic fertilizers and fossil fuels, and that are well adapted to the impacts of climate change. And this could include a range of different production systems, systems like regenerative or agroecological approaches that aim to build soil carbon and regenerate natural ecosystems, mixed farming systems that integrate cropping and livestock in sustainable ways, closed loop protected agriculture systems that use renewable energy to power glass houses and use recycled water to produce food and water crops. Vertical farms in the city that can supply recycled nutrients from city waste hyper efficiently to deliver fresh leafy greens to local residents or community-based production in inner city gardens and neighborhoods. A resilient food system is likely to draw on many diverse types of sustainable farming approaches, each adapted to different contexts. So we're not putting all our eggs in one basket and betting on just one type of sustainable farming approach for the future. It's really important to, for a more resilient food system that we're able to source food from different, different types of sources. So obviously, national food supplies are really important. Global food supplies are also important. And in fact, food prices would have risen much more in Australia during the millennium drought than they did if we weren't importing food. So that's a really important part of our food system. But I think that we've relied on those longer food supply chains quite heavily, and we've neglected um, the importance of our short local and regional food supply chains. So it's really important now to start to fill that gap, to start to rebuild those local regional food supply chains. And of course, there are multiple benefits that we can get from that as well, including, of course, economic benefits and supporting local farmers. Now, how do we do that? Well, I think it's probably not just one approach. You know, I think it's about um, investing in the infrastructure that we need for these local and regional food supply chains, ensuring that smaller scale farmers have appropriate infrastructure. And that can be anything from smaller scale abattoirs to smaller scale processing plants to making sure that um, farmers have access to adequate food processing plants in regional areas to um, just, you know, supporting some of the incredibly innovative work that is already being done in local regional food supply chains. Things like the Open Food Network, an open online platform that's connecting directly farmers with consumers and businesses in the city. So I think there's a whole range of things that we need to do. I think it's certainly about government action 
um, government action to invest in local and regional food supply chains and in supporting local farmers um, and in supporting farmers who are also supplying into the domestic food sector rather than just supporting export-oriented food production as well. But then there's also steps that local governments can take as well as state government and you know steps that the industry itself can take. But I think that the one of the key things is for government really to listen, you know, to listen to what it is that um, farmers and those working in the local and regional food sector are saying. I think people know what needs to be done, and it's really about listening um, to what they're saying and to in investing in those systems. Another opportunity to build resilience in the food system is to address insecure employment, low wages and poor working conditions in the food industry. COVID-19 has shone a spotlight on the vulnerability that poor working conditions and insecure employment can create in different parts of the food industry, from farm labourers to fast food workers, workers in food processing factories and in supermarkets. And the downward pressure that's placed on food prices and the drive for cheap food contributes to these poor working conditions and to the cost price squeeze that farmers are experiencing. What if instead we were to invest in strengthening local and regional food systems in a way that creates fair and secure forms of employment? as part of COVID-19 recovery, so that we're focusing on building a fairer food system for all the people who work throughout the food supply chain. I think we probably need to have a different sort of conversation about the value of food and about what is, you know, about how we pay an appropriate price for food that reflects the work the farmer has put into that, reflects the cost of actually producing the food, but also reflects those external costs where some types of food production um, have had a very detrimental impact on the environment as well. And we need to kind of pay for those impacts to reset the system. Now, the, then the question becomes, how do we do that in such a way that we're not disadvantaging very vulnerable people who do find it difficult to afford a healthy diet? So do we need to ha place taxes on some types of foods or some types of foods that are produced in particularly detrimental ways or ways that are detrimental to the environment, should we then subsidise other types of food? Should we subsidise healthier foods that people need to be eating more of? Do we um, take the revenue from taxing some types of foods that are uh, unhealthier and frankly are leading to you know, quite significant costs in the healthcare system? And do we then use that revenue to subsidise healthier foods? So I do think that we need to have a different sort of conversation about the price of food, about the value of food, and about how it is that we shift the food system to make healthier, more sustainably produced food the easy choice for people. Um, and yeah, the, the obvious choice and a choice that is affordable, but without unfairly impacting all those people back through the food supply chain. That's a very difficult conversation to have. And I think it's one that we're not really having at the moment. The emphasis very much at the moment is on just pushing down the price of food. But that has impacts that we're not discussing. Most importantly, there's an urgent need to redesign systems of food relief so that all Victorians have access at all times to a healthy, sustainable and culturally appropriate diet. And so that all Victorians can access food in a way that ensures their dignity, where they're not dependent on emergency food handouts. And so that ultimately our systems of food provisioning design out the very need for food relief. If we accept that one of the most basic goals of the food system should be to ensure that everyone has access to enough healthy and sustainably produced food, then it's fair to say the current food system is failing. An important part of resetting that system is for governments at all levels to recognise access to appropriate food as a fundamental human right and to examine their role in ensuring that all citizens are able to realise that right and also to realise that right through shocks and stresses to the food system. When we're just talking about food relief, and I guess that's in the context of, you know, everybody, everybody should have the right to have access to enough nutritious, sustainably produced and culturally appropriate food. We're particularly thinking about how do we ensure that the food that's provided to people is culturally appropriate, is diverse enough. And we saw some of those issues arise during COVID-19, where we had, for instance, some of the public housing 
towers that were locked down and government then needed to step in, ensure that people you know, were provided with enough food, but that food wasn't necessarily culturally appropriate. It wasn't the type of food that you know, people um, wanted access to in their diets, particularly people from migrant communities who are living in the towers. And part of the problem there is actually the way that our systems of food relief are currently designed in the sense that they're based on surplus food, they're based on food that would otherwise go to waste rather than thinking about the types of food that people actually need and ensuring that the food that's provided is healthy and you know, meets their dietary needs. So I think that's an example at the moment, really, where I was talking about the kind of systems of food relief, where those systems are broken and we need to actually just completely rethink um, what those systems look like for ensuring that everybody has access to enough healthy, sustainably produced and culturally appropriate Food, And we need to decouple those systems from systems of food surplus and food waste. And lastly, many interviewees in our research highlighted that COVID-19 is a transformational moment with potential for deep systemic change for our food system, as in many other areas of our lives, if we leverage the opportunities. The COVID-19 shock has put food system resilience and food security on the agenda and it's opened new policy windows. And as governments have responded rapidly and as other stakeholders have mobilised and innovated, it's also shown us what's possible. So how should we seize this moment to redesign our food system so that it's resilient in the face of increasing shocks and stresses and so that it achieves its most basic and fundamental purpose of ensuring that everybody at all times has access to enough healthy, culturally appropriate and sustainably produced food? I think the one thing that we'd really like people, everybody to understand is just to recognise that we are living in a perhaps a less certain environment than we have in the past. You know, we, I think we all recognise that we are, there are more shocks and stresses that are affecting many different aspects of our lives, climate related shocks that are already here. You know, we're seeing them. We can't predict everything that's going to happen in the future, but we do need to take actions now that build the fundamental long-term resilience of the food system. And some of those actions um, are, you know, things that are going to have multiple different benefits, economic benefits as well. And I think some of the most important things that we'd really like to see is just that we ensure that we protect the land, protect the water resources on the fringe of Melbourne, ensure that we are no longer um, no longer moving into areas of highly productive soil to build housing estates. It just doesn't make sense from a long-term point of view. And it's also about ensuring that not just our generation, but future generations of people who live in Melbourne are able to meet their own food needs, at least in part from food that's grown around the fringe of the city. We don't want to become entirely dependent on more distant sources of food. It doesn't make sense, and it certainly doesn't make sense moving into an environment where we're likely to face more frequent shocks and stresses to the system. And also that there's things that we can all do, I think, to strengthen the resilience of the food system. And that comes a bit from the way that we work with each other, the way that we um, network, form relationships in our own communities, look after each other, you know, check on our neighbours, um, think about how we can do things um, working with our local communities, even growing a bit of our own, you know, food ourselves. Um, that, yeah, we're really um, local, locally produced food is just one part of a more resilient food system, but it is a part that we've neglected in the past. I think it makes sense to focus a lot more on that in the future.